pray one more time for the sake of those that are got tuned back in again so nobody thinks I didn't open up a sermon without praying but but Lord we do commit this time to you Lord we thank you for today Lord I thank you for everyone who's here I thank you for everyone who, who couldn't be here for various reasons or those that are following along with us from other parts of the country Lord I pray that you would bless this message this morning Lord just as you've blessed our service so far that your Holy Spirit would breathe the breath of life upon these words, would plow up the soil of our heart, that the seed might take root. And when the harvest comes, it will return a harvest 30, 60, even 100 fold, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to go through the first 11 verses. I'm going to read them through once and then we'll go through them together. Uh, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him called us who called us by his own glory and excellence for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lusts now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing for you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, when I was printing out my notes, <laughs> some will be more happy than others to hear it but it printed out the first three pages of my notes and then the toner died in the thing and I thought that if I you know usually if you take the toner and cartridge out and you shake it a little bit and and put it back in you can convince it to give you just a little bit more but this morning it was like no no you're out and so I'm like so I'm missing the last pages of my notes but uh, but uh, so but we'll get uh, we'll get through this by God's grace and, and um, and you know, the thing is this morning, I just wanna be clear and simple about things and to go through this and to, um, you know, I, I was talking to Kevin yesterday <laughs> and I said, I said, you know, I've been like three different topics for, you know, I was in one place and then I felt like God took me somewhere else and then it was like, no, no, how about over here? And then, then he's like, no, no. And then I ended somewhere completely different than what I told him where I was going to be. But, you know, I, but it was all according to a thing. It was all background for, for these things. And, and, and it really, I was in Jude for a while. And if you read Jude and Second Peter side by side, they're very similar. And you have these two guys, um, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, and, and Peter, who was one of Jesus' closest disciples, are constantly at the end of their lives fighting against false teaching and fighting against stuff that, that has crept into the church. And they give a lot of the same warnings. But what's very, what I love about Peter is Peter starts out by saying, listen, this is where you should be. This is the foundation of your faith. This is the foundation of how you should be living your life. Yes, I'll get to the false teaching stuff later and what they're teaching, but first you need to know where you should be and how you should be living your life. And Simon Peter starts out and he says, a bondservant, an apostle to Jesus Christ. And I love the bondservants. You know, this is somebody who's a slave, who has no choice. Now, back then they had two different types of slaves, and I've, I've said this before, but 
but you had two different types of slaves. You had people who were like house slaves that owed you like maybe an indentured servant. Maybe they, didn't, they couldn't pay off a debt or something like that. So they came to work for you. But they would only work for you for a time while that debt was being paid off. And they usually would go home at night to their own home, had their own place. They're just trying to work off what they owed. That was one type of slave. But a bond servant, a doula, right? A doulos is a slave, meaning you were a slave to that person no matter what. And you couldn't exist on your own except in that person's household because they gave you everything. They gave you the food that you ate. They gave you the place that you slept. You, you belonged to that person. That was the type of slave that they talk about. <laughs> That's the type of slave that I am for Christ. I owe everything to him. He gives me everything. Everything that I have is because they deem it out of their goodwill that they're going to give it to me. That's what a bondservant is. And an apostle. To those who have received the faith of the same kind by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when he says received, I thought this is interesting because that word carries on that you receive something by casting of lots. That you... That God somehow, you could take it almost that God somehow decided from this that, you know, did some cosmic dice game, right? <laughs> and some people will take that and look at it and say, see, it's nothing of your own. This is all because God chooses. And, you, and we talked about this before. Are we saved because God chose us? Or are we saved because we chose God to follow him? Well, yes. It's, it's both and. God chose you. He knew you. Now, when, when we talk about knew, think of it in the sense, in the sense of how God knew Israel. It, it was a term of intimacy. It was a term between like how a husband and a wife know each other on a very intimate level. That's the way God knew Israel. He, he called Israel his bride. He knew his bride. That's the way God knows you on a very intimate level, very close. So yes, he chose us. He chose to send his son to die for us. Did we choose to follow him? Yes. It's both and. It's not an either or. It's both and. It wasn't by mere chance. It's not that. It's because of his, his good will that he would send his son to die for us and to choose us, that those that have faith in him. But it also, not only is it his choosing, but it, it's ours, and it demands a response. And not only an initial response, but a continual response. You, you don't get saved, and then that's, that's it, I'm in. Right? In one sense, yeah, you're, you are put in Christ, but there's a continual sanctification that goes on. There's a continually growing in Christ. And that's what Peter comes to explain. There's a growing that has to happen. He says that you're, we have the faith of the same kind. Peter's saying, listen, your faith and my faith are of the same value. I'm not worth more to God because... I'm an apostle of his. He, Peter's saying, you people, you that are, I'm writing this letter to, you and I have a salvation of the same worth. We are worth the same to God. Somebody's not worth more than somebody else because it was all paid and bought with the same price. The price of Jesus' blood. The price that Jesus paid to redeem Peter is the same price that he pays to redeem you. It cost Christ the same. It cost God the Father the same thing for every person who's saved. They're all bought with the same price. So Peter's saying, we're, our salvation is the same. Our salvation is of the same worth. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. I mean, so many, we, we want to know, how, how do we live in this world? How do we exist in this crazy, nutsoid place <laughs> that we're in? How, how are we supposed to know what we're supposed to do? Well, he says, God has granted us that we know everything pertaining to life. And where does that come? From this book. 
Peter goes on to say at the end of this letter, hey, listen, you know, I know Paul's hard to understand sometimes, but you need to listen to him. Because these are the words of life. The, the word tells us how we're supposed to live. Not, not only how we live, but instructs us in godliness. You think about that in Matthew. It says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Well, that's a tall order. I mean, you, I, I got to be perfect like God is perfect. There's no way I can be perfect like God can be perfect. Right, that's the point. You need a savior. The only way you can be perfect like our heavenly father is because Christ purchased righteousness for us in his own blood. Then we can be perfect. But we do have to strive for godliness. So how do we find out what, what this godliness, how to live in this godliness? He says, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. By his glory and excellence he has given us the word of God to know these things. <laughs> we need to trust the promises of God. I talk, I talk about this many times. And that's our faith. To me, that's what faith is. That you trust who God says he is according to his word and that you believe the promises that he made. And those promises, when we trust in those promises, that's what gives us hope for the future. I don't hope in this world at all. There's nothing in this world to hope for, to hope in. I don't hope in myself. I have no faith in myself to do things outside of God's will, to do out things outside of God's grace. His promises are our hope. And what's one of God's greatest promises? Romans 10, 8 through 11 says, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which, was, which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, revolt, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. That's, that's where my hope lies. I trust that promise that God gave. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And you will not be disappointed. I don't want to be disappointed. I hate being disappointed. But I'll tell you, every time I put any trust in man or put any trust in myself, what am I do? Disappointed. I've said this before. Listen, I only pr promise you one thing. I'm going to disappoint you at some time. If you put your trust in a man, you put, put your trust in me, anybody else. Only one thing I guarantee you. At some point, you're going to get disappointed. But we put our trust in God, we'll never be disappointed. Peter goes on, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Anybody else want to escape this world? <laughs> I can't wait to escape this world. I'd be totally happy, couldn't be happier if Christ came back in the middle of this church service. I don't think there's any better way for, for God to find you when he comes back. I'd be like, whew, at least he came back while we were in church, right? <laughs> Nailed it. It'd be like, you know. I can't imagine a better place to be when he comes back. But I'm not going to be like, no, no, wait, hold on a second. We've got to, I got to finish my sermon first. We got to wait. No. Christ come back any time. I'll be happy. That's what I want to be found serving him. He says, I go away. And the, the one that stands by the door and watches to know when the master returns. You don't want to be found asleep. You don't want to be off doing something else. But he says we can put on the divine nature of Christ through the Holy Spirit that indwells us when we're born again. And we sang that this morning, right? Christ purchased us with his own blood. You think about that. Acts 20, 28 says, 
that Christ purchased the church with his own blood. He purchased the bride with his own blood. Hebrews tells us that, that the blood of Christ sanctifies and obtains eternal redemption. Man, you, can't, you couldn't, God couldn't have paid a higher price. You couldn't, he couldn't have given a higher price for you than his own blood. That's why I think he, God is very jealous for his church, very jealous for his people because it cost him a lot to purchase you, to purchase your salvation. You think if you took your entire life savings to buy something for your children, and then you give it to them, this precious thing that you worked your entire life to give them. And then they just toss it around and don't treat it well and just play games with it. And you'd be like, why did I even do that? If they disdain the great gift that you gave them. That's what God means when he's jealous. Like, he, do you understand what it cost him to purchase your salvation? And he doesn't look kindly upon people that mess with this church or mess with other people who are Christian. He says, this is why you have to have brotherly love. Do you understand that God's saying for what it cost me to purchase that person? And you're going to treat them poorly? Who do you think you are? We need to think about, remember that when we deal with people, deal with church, deal with all this other stuff. It isn't ours, it isn't Anything, this, God purchased this. This is what it cost God. He says, now for this very reason, because of that, we, we can put on the nature of Christ. We have become heirs with Christ. You see, God doesn't have any stepchildren, right? God doesn't have any grandchildren. He just has heirs, sons and daughters. Just like Christ. But with position comes responsibility, right? You don't get to be like, oh, good, I'm just here for the inheritance. <laughs> like, no. If I give you this title, you have to fulfill the duties of that title. And if you don't, you'll be judged for it. Not only does it take us confessing, but it also, just as, as Dean pointed out this morning, it takes your mind, your heart, your hands, and your feet to fulfill that. Applying all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence. It takes work, diligent work. He says, applying all diligence. Listen, this is what you should be about. This is what you should be working at. You can't live a godly life casually. You will fail. Faith supplies your ability to live a virtuous life. I love this when he talks about moral excellence. It's the idea of valor. And it even carries, it even carries the connotation of like a very masculine, manly person. Now, there's a big thing within the church, and I don't know. You know, people, there's a lot, tons and tons of books that are written about biblical manliness. You know, how to be a man for God. What kind of man God wants you to be. And in, in a sense, I'm glad that they're at least addressing it. But usually it's just, a, you need to go out with the other dudes and howl at the moon. Is, is what it usually ends up being. With a few scriptures sprinkled in, right? And I'm telling you, that, that is not that much different than the message that the world tells, especially young men, who they need to be. You want to be a manly man? Well, how do you be a manly man? Well, you get these fast cars and you get all the blah, 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 right? And it's not any different. What it is is just fulfill the lusts of your flesh that you already want to do anyway. The world will tell you, fulfill the lusts of your flesh. Fulfill it with all, your all the desires that you want to do as a teenage boy. Just do more of that when you're an adult, and you'll be a man. And, you, and, and many of these biblical books, the, the biblical manliness, are the same thing. 
all the things that you want to do, go camping and going hunting and, and doing all this other stuff. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but what they're saying is that's how you be a man. Get back to nature. Do the, So it's just fulfilling what you want to do anyway with a little Bible verses sprinkled in on it. No, this is what Peter is saying. You want to know how to be a man? You want to know how to live a biblical life the way God wants a man to live? He's saying this, you supply moral excellence. You live a virtuous life. A man lives a morally excellent life. That's what biblical manliness is. You want to know how a man's supposed to conduct himself according to the Bible? You live a morally excellent life. That's how you do it. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. You want to live a morally excellent life, you need to grow in your knowledge. Like we talked about last time, when I said, what informs your conscience? For one, that you're saved, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and also your understanding of the Word of God. Your knowledge informs your conscience. While it's true that you can't live a morally excellent life without the knowledge of salvation, that's just a first step. There's so much more about learning what pleases God. Psalm 119, it says that, Lord, teach me to cherish your word in my heart. And why? So that I might not sin against you. Not so I can recite a bunch of Bible verses and, and impress people with how much of the Bible I can quote. No, hide them in my heart so that I learn not to sin against you. That's why you should cherish the word. Not so you can win an argument. Not so you can prove your point. It's so that you can learn not to sin against God. And in your knowledge, self-control. Knowledge should produce self-control. I hear it many times. Well, they know how I am, so no. No, if, you're, if you love God and you grow in his knowledge, you should be able to control your temper. You should be able to control your lust. You should be able to control your flesh. And how is that? How do we do that, right? That, it's, in one hand, it's very simple, but on the other hand, it's very difficult. How did Jesus refute Satan during his temptation? By quoting scripture. He didn't say anything of his own understanding. He didn't come up with, Satan, you know, you know who I am. What are you even doing here? No. What, Jesus quotes scripture in his, in his weakness, in his moments of temptation. He quotes scripture back to Satan. Because the word is powerful. The, world, the word of God even refutes Satan. Refute your temptation. Shepherd you through temptation. That's how wisdom and knowledge produces self-control. Self-control is the opposite of living in excess in the way this world wants you to live. You be you. You do you, right? That's the mantras of this world. Love is love. They like all these little pithy little things that are so far from the truth of the word of God. It's nothing but the flesh. And in your self-control, perseverance. I'm out of order here. Give me just a second. What are we trying to persevere in this world? Well, Hebrews tells us that we have to run the race that's set before us. Now, trust me, there's probably nobody here that loves, that hates running more than I do. I mean, I tell people, listen, if, I, if I'm running, then you better run too, because something big is coming, coming and I'm already out of ammunition, okay? That's the only reason I will run. If you see me running, you better, you better go the same direction. <laughs> Luckily, you'll probably be able to outrun me. For your sake. <laughs> For my sake, <laughs> yes. But we run the race set before us. That takes perseverance. That take, it's terrible sometimes. 
It's rough. But you have to keep running. I remember we did the Bix one time down in Davenport. And everybody's like, are you going to train? I'm like, no, because if I train, I'm going to talk myself out of it because I'm going to realize how bad it's going to be. But if I start, I won't stop. So I'll make it. It may not be pretty, but I'm going to finish. But if that, once you start, you can't stop. You've got to keep going, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how terrible it is. Maybe go back to the parable of the soils, right? It says, the good soil produces fruit with perseverance. With perseverance. It takes a long time to produce fruit. Especially when you farm the arid stuff we did back in Nebraska. Remember, somebody asked how much rainfall we get, and my aunt told them, and they said, what? I need to ask your husband how much rainfall you get. And she says, well, you don't think I understand how much? He says, no, no, listen, I'm sorry, lady, but <laughs> deserts get more rainfall than that. And we're like, yeah, we farm a desert, okay? It's a lot of work. It's patience. It takes a lot of time, a lot of work to, to get it to produce a crop. Your life's no different. God makes it grow. But you have to tend those gardens. You have to tend to your life. You have to pull out the weeds. You have to pull out the rocks. You can't just let it grow wild. You want to you produce a crop? That takes work, and it takes time, and it takes perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. The perseverance will produce the godliness that we're looking for. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. Kindness. Now, this word's Philadelphia. It's where we get the name of the city from. Brotherly love. Well, brotherly love is a very intimate type of love. You grow up with your brother, you know everything about your brother. You know what he likes, what he doesn't like. What pushes his buttons, because you're going to push them sometimes, right? But you know on an intimate level, your brother. And we're the family of God should love each other on the same intimate level. Kindness among the brethren. Now I'll tell you, there's, I was telling somebody this week too, like I, we have a lot of people and this isn't, I'm, I, I thank God for it. We have a lot of people who need rights to church, who do these different things, who, who need, and that's, I love that. Because I see the things that we do. And you know what, it's okay. It's okay to feel an obligation to come to church. It's okay to feel that, to spur each other to good works, that if I, it could be easy for somebody to get up and go, I just don't feel like going to church today. But when you know somebody else is relying on you to come, to sing, to play the piano, for a ride, for a ride, whatever it may be. When you know somebody's relying on you, you don't get to just sit back. I thank God that we're so small and we have people that need rides. Because we should spur each other to good works. We should feel that obligation to come to church. If you're in a, there was a five times, 20 times as many people, you might get out of that. And then you might start slipping through the cracks. But then the next thing you know, you haven't been here and nobody even notices. But no. We spur each other to brotherly love. Your brotherly kindness, because he goes on, right? We want to say one more thing about this. It's brotherly kindness, right? When, when you have such an intimate level. Now, I used to be a big proponent of... I, especially in the military, right? That <laughs> familiarity breeds contempt. The more you got to know about, the more the, you got to know your boss, the more you probably despise the guy. But you know what, that, that, that is, in one sense, that saying is right. But the opposite is also true. The more we know about somebody, we have a choice. When you grow in your knowledge of somebody, you can either let it become contempt or you can let it become love. 
Familiarity can breed contempt or it can, or it can breed love. Because the more you learn about that person, the more you see their flaws, the more you see the things that they're not perfect, you can either say, you know what, I don't like that person because of what I see in their life, or you can say, you know what, I love that person even more because I'm willing to still be in fellowship with that person despite their flaws. Look, I got plenty of them, trust me. And the more you get to know me, you can either grow in contempt or you can grow in love. So yeah, familiarity does breed contempt, but Christ comes in and says, no, no, I don't care about what that, you need to love one another. Because he goes on, and in your brotherly kindness, love. And I see people, see this always, one thing builds on the next. Your knowledge and all that lays the foundation. Paul tells us that of all of these, the greatest is love. Without love, you are nothing, right? But <laughs> you can't say that you love people when you don't have the building blocks underneath of it. He goes on to say, you're blind. You deceive yourself. For these qualities are, for if these qualities are yours and increasing, I love, he says, if, I don't know, maybe they're not. If these are your qualities and they're increasing, means you can't be content with where you are. Man, I'm a pretty good guy. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I do this, I do that, I do live. I'm pretty content with where I'm at. No. He says, first, if you even have these qualities, and next, are they growing? Are you growing in these areas? If you are, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Now, I love this. Having forgot your purifications. Somebody can be saved and grow in this stuff, and then they let the world creep in. They let the flesh creep in. And he says, you know what? You're blind. And you forgot the forgiveness that you once had. Man, that's a bad place to be. That you don't even see. Makes me think of Sodom, right? God strikes them blind, but they're so driven by their lust, so driven by the flesh, they don't even notice they're blind. They're willing to just plow right through that. We can become the same thing. If we don't take inventory of these in our life, are we growing in knowledge? Are we growing in our brotherly love for one another? Are we growing in these things? Are, are they getting better in our life? If we don't take inventory to see if they're growing, we are blind. Blind. And you'll be driven by the lusts of your flesh. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the thing we talk about, right? Everybody wants a Savior, but few people want a Lord. Everybody wants to be forgiven of the sin in their life, but they don't want anybody to tell them not to sin. Jesus has to be both Lord and Savior. Will be abundantly supplied to you. He says, be all the more diligent to make certain the calling. How do... Look, we, we can't do anything. This isn't a works-based faith. It isn't, well, you do your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. But no, what Peter's saying is you need to work to show that these things are growing in your life. And how? why? Why do you do that? Because that's what lets you know that you are saved. Look, it's a pass-fail test. It's not graded on a curve. It's not, 
Some are going to get a passing score, and the ones above the, the, this line, you guys get in, and the ones below this line, you get out, and there's this big, long, no. <laughs> you either get 100% or you get a zero. Heaven doesn't work like that. Heaven doesn't work like class. Man, there's a lot of people failing, so we're going to put it on a scale so you guys can, we can get more people to pass the test. No. He said, listen, there's more people, there's many more people going to hell than they're going to heaven. Many more people. But he says, you need to be diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing of you. It's not certain for God, not certain for other people, but certain for yourself. You want to know if you have abundance, you have eternal salvation? Are you living according to the word? Are you doing the things that he wants you to do? That's not going to earn you salvation, but it's a good test. Because you can be blind. You can kid yourself. He even says there are going to be people on the day of judgment who don't get in and come up and go, well, wait, wait, Lord, Lord, didn't, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do? We did all this stuff in your name. You people that try to finagle people and then they get to heaven and they even try to finagle God. Wait, 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 let's make a deal here. Come on, God. Like, I mean, I did a lot of stuff, right? What does is, what is God tell him? Depart from me, you who work with iniquity. What? For I never knew you. It's not a... It's pass fail. You can kid yourself about all these things. I cast out demons, I prophesied, I te I did this, I did that. Jesus says that's like the Pharisee says in there. It's like, <laughs> I tithe everything, I even tithe my, tithe my spices. And thank God for not making me like that horrible sinner over there. But what does the sinner do? Sits there and smotes his chest and says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's a humble life. That's a life who's informed by the knowledge of God that yes, you know what, you are a sinner. You do need redemption. And because I bought you with a price so dear and so precious to me, you have a role to fulfill. This is what that role looks like. You need to fulfill these pieces. Believe me, it's not easy. If church is easy, everybody be doing it, right? And you've got a lot of people who go to church, blind leading the blind, right into a ditch, right off the cliff. They thank God that he's still here. Thank God that he won't let us go. He doesn't let us get comfortable. He doesn't let us just say, you know what, you guys, you're living your best life now, and keep going with what you're doing. <laughs> no, 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 He says, hey, it's great you got those things. Is it getting better? Are you doing more? God, I'm stretched. I get it. You doing more? Well, God, I already do. I, great. Are you doing more? I don't got anything else to give. Well, good. Well, good. Now you're going to let me start working. I've been there. I've done that. He'll let you run into that wall and run into that wall. Then you step back to take another run at it, and he taps you on the shoulder and it's like, you want me to take a crack at it, or are you going to, you got one more left in you? And you're like, oh, man. Okay. Okay, God, I get it. I get it. Okay. I guess I'll let you do it. He goes, okay. I've been here the whole time. I just wondered. But God's good. God's good. But no, when you grow in this, when we do these things, when we love one another, we grow in all of this, right? What does he say? The eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Not barely. Not a little bit. 
not just enough, abundantly supplied to you, more than you need. His righteousness is more than we need, but that's what it requires for us to get into heaven. And it will be. You do these things, it will be abundantly supplied to you. That's good news. That's a good promise. Those are the promises we need to believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your encouragement, Lord. These are encouraging texts. Lord, that, yeah, we may need to step back and take inventory. We may need to step back and see where we need to grow in areas if we're failing in areas, Lord. But you love us enough to teach us these things. You love us enough to not let us be content with our own blindness, with our own short-sightedness, Lord. That's not the life you intended for us. You intended so much more, so much more for us. Lord, I pray that we would continue to grow, that these virtues would be increasing in us. That we would work with all diligence to gain what you supply for us in abundance, Lord. Help us to grow this week, Lord. Help us to take inventory. Help us to continue to grow in your faith, to work out our faith in fear and trembling, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.